So you want to start out and become a wedding photographer, but you're not sure what you need to buy, like what camera is best, what lens or what accessories you need starting out. So today I thought I'd share with you my best practice of what you need to buy starting out as a wedding photographer, as well as how you can save money when building up your wedding photography kit. And I'm going to start right now. So when I started out in the wedding industry, I was overwhelmed with the amount of options out there and everyone telling me this is what you need. And there's just so many options when it comes to cameras, there's hundreds and hundreds of lenses. So what one is right for wedding photography starting out? So today I thought I'd make a quick video discussing what I had starting out, as well as what I learned the hard way so you don't make the same mistakes I do when starting out in the wedding photography industry in 2023. Right, so let's kick this list off talking about cameras. Now, we could spend all day talking about what is the best camera for wedding photography. So we're not gonna go down that route in this video. We're gonna be just talking about what you need for essentials. So what the camera needs to have. Every camera brand offers great cameras. Fujifilm, Canon, Nikon, Sony, all of these are great cameras. And to be honest, I don't think there's necessarily a bad camera out there. So I don't think you're gonna necessarily make a bad choice in that regard. But there are a few specifications I think the camera needs to have starting out in the wedding photography industry. So the first thing is dual card slots. Now this isn't necessarily essential, but it is highly recommended. I started out with a camera, a Canon 6D, and it only had one card slot. So it isn't necessarily essential, but it is something I highly recommend. Now the reason for that, it allows you to shoot redundant. Now shooting redundant basically means you're shooting to two cards at the same time. So if you've ever had a card corrupt or you lost your card in your bag, you've got a backup available. Think of it like a car tire in your car, a spare one. You know, if you ever have a puncher, you know you've always got a spare one that you can rely on and it's the same with card formats. Now the more expensive professional cameras usually have dual card slots, but the cheaper ones usually don't. So again, it really comes down to price point and what you can afford. It's recommended, but I wouldn't say it's necessarily essential starting out. Another thing I would look out for is mirrorless cameras. Now mirrorless cameras are the newer cameras on the market. If you buy a new Canon camera or a new Sony camera, the likelihood is going to be mirrorless. Now again, it isn't necessarily essential that you need to buy a mirrorless camera. It just means you're gonna be open up to more lens options, which is actually more important than the camera choice that you're making. Now DSLRs or digital single lens reflex cameras are slightly older. They've got a mirror, they're usually a little bit heavier and they have a slower autofocus system. Again, you can take stunning images with these cameras. It just means that you're limited to what brand new lenses you can buy. Again, mirrorless cameras are smaller, lighter, they have a slightly better autofocus system and they're newer. So you're, they're gonna be more out there. So again, it really does come down to price, but if you can stretch to it, I highly recommend buying a mirrorless camera. Again, most camera brands nowadays are mirrorless. If you ever buy a new Fujifilm or a new Sony, for the last, I think, five to 10 years, they've actually only been doing mirrorless. So there are a few options out there. Just bear in mind, there are those two options, mirrorless and DSLR. And if you're tossing between the two, I would recommend mirrorless. Now, the last thing I recommend the camera to have is a fairly fast frames per second rate. So that's how many photos it can take in a second. I would say look for a camera that has maybe more than five frames per second. Again, this isn't essential, but it, what it will do is it will allow you to capture the exact moment you want. Sometimes in a wedding, things happen incredibly fast. So let's say you've got confetti or the first kiss, for example. You don't wanna miss that essential shot. So what a camera will do will allow you with a faster frames per second is capture multiple shots and then in post-production, choose the one that looks best. Again, not necessarily essential. I started out with a camera, I think I shot about four or five frames per second, which is enough. Some cameras now can shoot like 40 frames per second, which I think is far too much for wedding photography. But you can find a middle ground, maybe a camera that can shoot between five and 10 frames per second is probably great. Again, comes down to price points or what you can afford, but those three things is what I recommend. So if it's a mirrorless camera, again, newer cameras are usually better. They've got slightly better specs. I would buy a camera that has two SD card slots or dual card slots, that is definitely helpful for insurance purposes. And then lastly, is a slightly faster frames per second, just to allow you to capture the right moment when it comes to wedding photography. So when it comes to what camera you should buy, I would just buy something that you feel comfortable shooting. If you're used to shooting on Canon cameras, 
then buy a Canon camera. If all of your friends are shooting on Sony, you've never really used a proper camera before, then maybe buy Sony camera. They'll be able to help you out with the menu system and how the camera operates and what lenses you should buy. Now, one thing I would definitely say is don't worry about the size of the sensor. Sensors kind of come in three sizes, micro four thirds, APS-C, and then full frame. Don't think you need a full frame camera to start out. I had a 7D, which is an APS-C sized sensor camera when I started when I started out. And to be honest with you, it was great. Every single camera today will take great images. It's got nothing to do with the size of the sensor. There are benefits and disadvantages to all sensor sizes. So you'll just need to work out what one fits you best. I personally prefer full frame, but they are far more expensive. So if your price point can't stretch to that, then buy an APS-C camera. Or let's say you like Olympus or Panasonic, they offer micro four third size sensor cameras. And again, they're genuinely great. So don't worry about the size of the sensor, just work out what one works for you and what one you're most comfortable shooting with. Now, all of those specs might actually increase the price of the camera. So one thing you can do to save yourself a gigantic amount of money, and is what I do all the time, is buy second hand. Now, you don't have to buy second hand off of Facebook or eBay. What you can do is buy it from a reputable dealer like Wexphoto Video, Jessup's or MPB, which will come with a warranty, maybe a 12 month or a six month warranty. So you know you've got a little bit of reassurance that you know you're buying something that works. Now, obviously you can buy brand new, you know, brand new is lovely, but it does come with a high price point. So if you can, and if you would like to save some money, I highly recommend buying second hand. It saves yourself so much money and will allow you to spend more money on lenses and accessories that actually make a larger or a bigger impact to your wedding photography. Right, so after you've brought your camera or you've chosen it, let's talk about lenses. Now, lenses will make a bigger impact on the quality of your images than your camera. Camera pretty much just controls your resolution, so how many megapixels your image is going to end up being. But your lens, on the other hand, controls the kind of quality of that image. So the depth of field, the aperture, the focal length, these are all things that are controlled by your lens. Now, in photography, you get two main types of lenses. You get zoom lenses and you get prime lenses. Now, starting out in wedding photography, I'm firstly gonna be talking about prime lenses because it's predominantly what I shoot. Now, prime lenses, unlike zoom lenses, have a fixed focal length, which means you're not gonna be able to zoom in and zoom out. Now, that gives you actually a few benefits. But there are also a few disadvantages that we'll need to talk about with prime lenses. Prime lenses usually have a brighter aperture, which means firstly, it's gonna be better in low light, but it's also gonna create a shallower depth of field. Aperture is basically how large is the hole on the front of your lens and how much light is let in through the lens to the sensor. Now, usually prime lenses are smaller, which is good for carrying them around. They're usually lighter as well, and they're usually cheaper in some situations. So that is the main benefit of prime lenses. I personally think you end up with a sharper image as well. But again, that really depends on what prime lens and what zoom lens you're comparing them against. But on average, with a nice big broad brush, predominantly prime lenses are gonna offer you slightly better image quality over a zoom lens. And also restriction breeds creativity. So if you're using a prime lens, you're gonna to have to physically walk around to get the right shot, to get the right composition. And, and in doing so, you might end up with a better shot overall than just simply zooming in with a zoom lens. So, you know, there's a famous saying where they say, you know, the best photo is the photo you take six steps behind you because, you know, you've thought a little bit about more your composition. So just simply zooming in and kind of sniping from the other side of the room, it forces you to be a little bit more creative. And that's not saying that when you buy a zoom lens, you're not being creative. It just means that you're, it's forcing you to become a more creative photographer and that might help starting out. Now, if you're thinking about what prime lens you want to buy, there are four recommendations. A 24 millimeter, a 35 millimeter, a 50 millimeter and an 85 millimeter. These are the ones I specifically would start out. My two favorite is a 35 millimeter and an 85 millimeter, but I also own a 50 mil and also a 24 mil. Now, after you've set up that, another lens you might wanna get is a macro lens. And again, these are usually prime lenses. The one that I recommend is a 100 mil macro. Again, you don't necessarily have to start out with a macro lens, but it's definitely handy when you're capturing the fine details, like the wedding ring, or maybe you're focusing on the venue and you wanna focus on something that's quite small. A macro lens will allow you to do that. So they're the big benefits of macro lenses. The main disadvantage is obviously that they can't zoom. 
Now, zoom lenses, on the other hand, I think are incredibly versatile. They let you zoom in and zoom out incredibly quickly. Now, in some cases, things happen very, very fast with wedding photography. You know, the first kiss, you can't ask them to do it again because you were busy swipping out your prime lenses, and that's where a zoom lens will help out. If you wanna take a nice wide angle venue shot and then a nice telephoto shot, you're gonna be able to do that with a zoom lens versus a prime lens. Now you can get around that by buying two camera bodies, and it's what I recommend, but not necessarily starting out because again, just adds more to the price. I recommend one camera body first, then over time buy two. But with a zoom lens, it almost lets you have two camera bodies at the same time. Again, the versatility of that focal range will give you a nice wide shot and a nice tight shot at the same time. So you're never gonna miss the moment. And that sometimes is more important. Capturing the shot is more important than what kind of image quality that shot is if you've missed it, you know? And it's the same with wildlife. You know, you don't wanna necessarily miss the shot because you're busy swapping lenses. That's the last thing you want. You wanna take, make sure you get all the key shots throughout the day. And a zoom lens will let you do that because of its versatility. Now, the three lenses I would recommend if you're looking down the zoom lens route is a 15 to 35 mil, a 24 to 70 mil, and a 70 to 200 mil. The one I highly recommend is that 70 to 200 mil. It's a great versatile lens for wedding photography. But of course, it really depends on what workflow or what kind of type of photography you're going for. If you're going to beautiful venues, you want a wide angle zoom lens to capture all that amazing detail. But, you know, if you're in a slightly smaller venue and you just wanna capture the first kiss from behind everybody, let's say you're in a church, then that 70 to 200 mil is going to be great. Now, what I'm not saying is you need to buy just zoom lenses or you need to buy just prime lenses. What you can do, and it's what I do, is you can choose. You can choose some zoom lenses and some prime lenses to kind of, you know, complement each other. You can buy some wide angle prime lenses and maybe a telephoto zoom lens, and that's great for versatility, but also for image quality. So mix it up a bit and see what works for you. Now again, ways to save money when it comes to buying either prime or zoom lenses is buy second hand. Highly recommend do that with lenses. Now lenses, unlike cameras, have a lower refresh rate. So when you buy a lens, especially a good quality lens, you're never necessarily gonna ever need to replace it unless you either damage it or you want to upgrade to another lens. Where cameras, on the other hand, every few years, you're probably gonna wanna upgrade because the technology increases dramatically over the kind of lifespan of that camera, where lenses, on the other hand, you could buy a lens from the 90s and it'd still be really good today. Some of my lenses are from the early 2000s and they have a great image quality, even on modern cameras. So to be honest with you, I would buy secondhand pretty much straight away. Unless you're after the newest lens with the newest kind of best image quality, to be honest, secondhand lenses are really, really good. I don't have a single gripe with any of the lenses I own. I think. I think all of them are secondhand. I don't think I own a single brand new lens. So highly recommend buying secondhand lenses if you get the chance. And if you want to know more of the things to look out for, I've got a video and I'll place in the link in the description on the top 10 to look out for when buying secondhand lenses. Right, so you've chosen the camera, you've chosen the lenses that you want to shoot with. What else do you need to buy? What is essential for wedding photography? So now let's talk about lighting. So lighting for weddings is really important. And the reason for that is it lets you shoot later on into the day and also shoots lets you shoot in darker environments. So some venues like churches are quite dark and some cameras and lenses are gonna struggle with the amount of light. So flashes and lighting is really important for wedding photography. Now, when starting out, I would probably recommend flash guns. Now, flash guns are the ones that can sit on top of your camera as well as off camera as well. They're slightly smaller and usually quite cheap. Now, there are quite a few brands out there. I personally would buy the brand of your camera choice. So let's say you choose Canon like myself. Canon flash guns are really good. I know Sony do them and I know Nikon do some. So I'd maybe buy those. Or if you want to buy some third party ones, the two that I would personally recommend is Godox and Profoto. Now flash guns are great because they let you shoot on camera and off camera as well. So when you're starting out, I recommend shooting on camera. So basically have the flash gun sitting right on top of the camera on its hot shoe. This will let you fill the light basically in front of the camera. You can have it pointing up, bouncing off the ceiling to add a little bit more of a scattered light look. And it's not so necessarily direct. It offers nice smooth lighting. What this will prevent is basically having either grainy or blurry photos due to shooting at the wrong ISO or wrong shutter speed. Now, 
once you feel a little bit more comfortable, you can shoot off camera. So the flash is sitting on a light stand and basically it's away from the camera. And what you can do is then have it bouncing off the walls, bouncing off the ceilings, and it will fill the light a little bit more evenly. And then you can buy multiple. You will obviously have to buy a trigger that sits on top of your camera to trigger the light, but it's usually fairly inexpensive. Sometimes they're only 50 to 100 pound just for the trigger, usually takes AAA batteries, and then it lets you trigger off camera. And you can have as many as you want. I believe Godox and Profoto, you can have up to eight on a single channel, which is really nice. So if you wanna be a little bit more creative with your work, I would recommend shooting off camera, but when starting out, on camera can help. So if you wanna do rain shots or ring shots like these photos here, off camera is definitely the way forward. But firstly, let's just get comfortable when shooting on camera flash first. Now, when looking at what flash gun and what light you wanna buy, another thing I would look for is modifiers. So these are things that you would put in front of your flash or allow your flash to bounce off of to create different looks. So a dome, for example, like this one here, or maybe an umbrella, a softbox, these modifiers will let you shoot quite creative. You can use colored gels to color the flash color, which is really nice. So if you wanna do shots like this, where you're shooting at a wall, but you're wanting to add a color and a silhouette look, buying a colored pink or blue gel will add a little bit more creativity to it. And also, they're usually quite cheap. Magmod is a great brand that does a range of different basically magnetic modifiers that work with pretty much any flash gun. And I know Profoto and Godox do specific ones for their flashes. So if you wanna be fairly creative with your work and add a little bit more of a, a unique look to your specific wedding photography, then buying flash modifiers and flash diffusers could really help you out. And again, if you wanna save some money, highly recommend buying secondhand. Now, when it comes to flashes, you wanna look at how many flashes it's taken over its lifetime. Uh, it sometimes is in the description if you're buying it from a reputable dealer like Wex Photo Video, they'll, they'll say how much it's been used. If you buy it from eBay, it might not necessarily say that, but you wanna look for ones that don't have dents, scratches, or have been dropped. They are quite delicate flashes, so you wanna make sure that they have been looked after. But if you do buy secondhand, it can save yourself a decent amount of money. And it's the same with diffusers and modifiers. You know, an umbrella is an umbrella, a softbox is a softbox, you know, it's very difficult to break. So if you buy secondhand, you can save yourself a whole heap of money that you're able to spend money on other things like a nice computer to speed up your editing workflow or maybe even another lens. Right, so are there any more accessories that I recommend when starting out with wedding photography? Yes, there are quite a few. So let me quickly list through them now. So the first thing you want to buy are cards and you wanna buy lots of them. You wanna buy more than you need. Now, the reason for that is you don't wanna run out of space on a wedding or what you don't wanna do is leave some at home. So maybe chuck in some in your bag and just leave them. So if you do go on a wedding day and you go, oh no, I've forgotten all of my cards, you've got some spare in your bag. Now, when it comes to cards, and really this is the only one I would say is buy branded. So I wouldn't necessarily buy off branded third party Amazon knockoff ones because what you don't wanna do is have corruption issues. This is really the only time I would recommend buying branded anything for photography. The last thing you wanna do is have corruption issues or just be able to get the information off of the card. So brands that I personally would recommend would be SanDisk. Uh, Sony makes some really nice tough cards. They're like full metal. I personally shoot on a lot of those, and then maybe Lexar as well. These are the brands that I personally would recommend, and the ones that I specifically use. I've had a few friends that have brought some kind of weird Amazon Chinese knockoff ones, and they've gone, James, the cards don't work, what am I gonna do? I'm like, ah, you should buy Reptable. You know, they're not that much more expensive, and to be honest, they will save you a whole headache if you end up having problems in the future. So. I would highly recommend buying branded cards. Now, another thing to note is SD cards aren't the only card format out there. You've got CF Express Type B cards, CF Express A cards, CF cards. There's a lot of card formats. So do your research and work out what your camera takes. My Canon R5, the one that I'm shooting on at the moment, the one that I use for weddings, actually uses CF Express Type B cards, which are far more expensive than SD cards, simply because the camera can shoot quite fast, it can shoot 8K, so you know, you're gonna have the card that keeps up with the speed. So do bear in mind that you might be buying a nice fancy camera, but to, you know, to actually use all of the specs, you're gonna have to buy a nice fancy card, and they can be very expensive. So look for, you know, 
a camera that can shoot maybe SD cards to start out with because they're fairly reasonably priced. So the next thing are batteries and try and buy as many as you can. And remember, do your research or working out what battery goes with your camera. Now, luckily most camera brands now have one or two batteries to go with all of their cameras. So if you ever do upgrade, the batteries will be able to migrate from your old camera to your new camera. And luckily Canon, I believe Sony do the same thing. They pretty much have one that specific battery, which is nice. But again, try and buy as many kind of batteries as you can. And also, again, I would try and buy native batteries. So if you're buying a Canon camera, camera, try if you can buy native Canon batteries because sometimes, especially Sony, they come up with a warning error every single time and you might have um, like error codes popping up throughout the day. So it's just irritating. So what I would recommend is if you're buying a nice Sony camera, buy some nice Sony batteries with it and buy as many as you can. So the next thing I would buy is a nice camera strap because you're gonna be walking around and carrying your camera all day, the last thing you want is an uncomfortable strap. Now, some brands come with a neck strap, which is nice, but that is hella uncomfortable after like 12 hours of use. The last thing you wanna do is get home and you've got so bad neck problems, you never wanna do a wedding again. So buying a nice, comfortable strap is really going to help. Now, I buy a company called Holdfast, which create these beautiful leather straps, which are unbelievably comfortable for very long shoots. It's a dual harness, so basically it lets you shoot on two cameras at the same time. I believe they do one for a single camera setup as well. So that's a brand that I would highly recommend. They're definitely on the expensive side, but I personally would spend a little bit less money on the camera and buying a nice camera strap because that's what you're gonna be kind of interacting with for the day. You don't want an uncomfortable strap because you're just not gonna to wanna to shoot again and that's just gonna off put you for the rest of kind of the shoot. So I would buy a nice comfortable strap. Now you don't have to buy Holdfast, you can buy any brand. Peak Design is another really good brand that create nice comfortable straps, but a nice, comfortable, well-made strap is gonna last to hopefully the lifetime of your wedding industry, as well as you not gonna have back or neck problems for the rest of your life. And similar to camera straps, camera bag. You wanna have a nice camera bag. So if you're walking around, you've got to do a long hike, let's say you're doing a beautiful engagement shoot up a mountain, you want a nice, comfortable bag that firstly fits all of your essential kit. So flashes, lights, uh, you want maybe a camera, a couple room for lenses, maybe even a laptop all of that in one bag. Now, obviously, in some situations, like a light stand, you want a, an additional bag, but you want a bag that's nice and comfortable. I'd also recommend a bag that can lock. So uh, I've got one that's got like a little TSA lock on the top, and that's great if you're going to, you know, a wedding that you've got to leave your bag in an area and you've got to walk off. You don't want someone to necessarily steal all your stuff out of it. So a lockable bag is just a prevention measure that you can have so someone doesn't nick all of your camera equipment. Another thing you can get is a hard case. Now I've got a Pelican case, really nice, and what you can actually do is put an air tag in it. So it's actually trackable as well. So you can lock it with padlocks and have it tracked. So if you're a little bit, you know, not sure where you're shooting or you're shooting not necessarily a great area or simply you've got to leave your stuff and go away for a long period of time, having a hard case or a lockable bag could definitely help out. So again, keep a little bit of money left over after you've brought your camera and lenses and think about a nice camera strap and a nice bag. So next is a drone. Now this is not necessarily essential because some wedding places, some venues don't allow drones anymore, which is a little bit frustrating, but some of them do. And what it'll do is it'll just let you get another perspective of your kind of venue and you can really establish the venue when it comes to photography. So say you go into a beautiful landscape, you know, you've got these mountains in the background, you've got this lovely venue and they're doing maybe a wedding outside. A drone will allow you to capture another perspective and really make your kind of photos stand out. It's really good for kind of an establishing shot. Now obviously some drones are better than others. I shoot on the DJI Mavic 3 Cine, lovely, lovely drone. I shoot both photo and video with it because I think it's a genuinely great drone, but you can get smaller drones. I know DJI do some like Mini 3 Pro, they do a Mini 3. You can also buy secondhand drones as well. There's a lot on the market. A lot of people buy drones and then they don't necessarily use it and they want to sell it for something else. So you can get yourself a really good deal if you want to buy something, uh, you want to buy a drone secondhand. So if you want to add another perspective to kind of wedding photography, a drone is actually a really good purchase. Right, so after you've got all of that, let's talk about the fun stuff. So this is the stuff that you can really use to kind of make your kind of work a little bit more creative. 
atmosphere spray, really nice. Good for smaller venues. You can use the kind of flash to flash through it. You can add a lot of atmosphere, hence the name atmosphere spray, to your photos. It can make them really stand out. Now, if you're shooting outside, atmosphere spray doesn't necessarily work because it just ends up getting blown away in the wind. So something else I'd recommend is smoke grenades. Now, smoke grenades are just fun and they're just enjoyable for the couple or for the bride and groom to use. So if you want to add some color to your work, let's say you go into a venue that's very pastel go ahead and add in some bright orange or some bright blue. Smoke grenades are just enjoyable to use. So atmosphere spray and smoke grenades can add another perspective to your wedding photography. Firstly, great fun for the couple. They're gonna remember that, but also they can add a little bit more creativeness to your work that would maybe would have been just a bland shot. Chuck in some atmosphere spray, boom. Stunning shot for your portfolio. Another thing you could get are fractal filters or some flare filters, or you know, have a look at some filters that you can add either to the front of your lens or you can actually buy. I've got these fractal filters that kind of create these prismy looks. This one looks like a Pac-Man and they're quite good for putting in front of your lens and adding in like these kind of crazy filters to it. Now I wouldn't necessarily do it for the first kiss because they're like, Maybe out of the 100 photos you take with it, one will be really good. So they're quite a low hit rate, I've got to admit, because you end up with quite odd looking photos, but you can get some really creative work. And again, they're not that expensive. 80, 90 pound for some really nice fractal filters, you know, and if you don't particularly like them, go ahead and sell them on. You know, you don't necessarily have to use and keep everything you own. So when starting out, I try and be as creative as possible with all these little accessories that don't necessarily cost that much versus maybe buying another lens or even another camera. And the last thing I'd recommend, and this is specifically just for you, is a water bottle. Now, if you've never shot a wedding before, you won't believe how much you talk throughout the entire wedding day. Shouting at guests to kind of move out the way, you're in the back of the shot, because guests are terrible. It's like herding cats through the entire day. It's very frustrating, especially when it comes to group shots. Trying to work out who's the mother of the bride and trying to get them into the shot because they've walked off because they want to get a drink from the bar. You're going to be talking so much, you'll be raising your voice. So a decently sized water bottle will go a long way so you don't lose your voice halfway through the ceremony. It's something that I learned on the first couple of weddings. I've come back and I'm like <laughs> really struggling to speak just because I've been talking all day. So getting a nice water bottle is, is really helpful. Again, you can put some juice in it, you know, maybe put some Coca-Cola or something like that, something that you like, but you know, having a broken voice at the end of the day is really frustrating. So yeah, highly recommend a water bottle. Brilliant, and there we go guys. So that's what I recommend when starting out with wedding photography. Now, of course, I've probably missed a few things. So if you are a wedding photographer, use the comment section to help other photographers out. Again, we are starting with a brand new season in 2023. So quite a few people want to probably start getting wedding photography. So if you've stumbled across this video and you think I've missed something, make sure to write it down in the comments below. Again, just remember to have fun with your wedding. Go prepared, make sure all of your cards are formatted, make sure your batteries are charged, you know, make sure you're having fun. That's the most important thing. Don't worry about, oh, my camera is only APS-C, I'm not gonna be able to take wedding photos because I need full frame. That's not true. Whatever camera you've got and whatever lens you've got will work. And you're gonna take beautiful images as long as you just keep trying. Because trust me, it is, I love weddings and they're not stressful if you go in prepared and ready to go. I've been James for Photo Fever, and I'll catch you guys next time. <laughs>